Hi, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for Nature's Remedies from the Hive with the Bee Chicas who are on screen with me. I'm Kathy Lane, Programs, Events, and Outreach Coordinator with the Boulder Public Library. Just Rainey is behind the scenes engineering the live stream. And before we begin, I have some housekeeping. First, this event is being recorded and will be available on Boulder Public Library's YouTube channel after today. And all of our events are an extension of library services library conduct policies apply in our online space. If you enjoy this presentation, there are more online programs for you to enjoy. Please visit our website at boulderlibrary.org for our full virtual events calendar. This event is part of Seed to Table, focusing on sustainable living with gardening, cooking, and bee chica programs. I'd also like to thank the Boulder Library Foundation for its generous sponsorship of this and so many of our library events. Finally, at any time during this event, you can post your questions in the chat by logging into your Google, YouTube, or Facebook accounts to post questions. Your questions will be answered later during the audience Q&A portions of this event. So Boulder Public Library and the City of Boulder have been working with the Bee Chicas since 2015 for seat to table workshops. You might see them from the Boulder Creek Path taking care of the library bee hubs on the roof of the main library in their colorful beekeeper suits. The Bee Chicas are also volunteer coordinators for Pollinator Appreciation Month and the Boulder Bee Festival. Visit beboulder.org slash howto for resources, recipes, and videos. So I would take great pleasure in introducing Tracy Bell Humer, Teresa Beck, Cynthia Scott, and Deborah Foy. They are scientists, artists, gardeners, beekeepers, and pollinator advocates here to share um, some of their wisdom and um, science knowledge with you today. Bee Chicas, thank you so much for adapting what would have been an in-person workshop for this virtual experience during the pandemic. And Deborah, I'm going to hand over to you. Super, thanks, Kathy. Um, we just wanna welcome everybody today. We're very excited to share these remedies with you. Um, just a quick overview of the uh, workshop today. We're gonna have two quick videos with a pause for Q&A after each one. So if you have questions about how to do it or things involved, you can speak with us directly. And then Tracy's gonna do a quick live demo at the end of some honey ointments. So stick around for that. You can find the recipes and our demo videos on our website at beechicas.com. And Kathy has included a link directly to our website in the chat. If you wanna just click on that now, maybe print out the recipe sheet and jot down any notes as we go through the workshop. Um, one quick reminder, we are not medical professionals. These are, very effective home remedies that we have used successfully for years and we are excited to share those with you but check with your medical professionals if you have specific questions about your own health and i think we'll kick things off with an elderberry video we're going to show you now how to make elderberry syrup and um the recipe is Pretty simple, we're gonna use um, uh, dried elderberries. These are a variety um, of a European elderbe elderberry, uh, Sambucus nigra. So you can use also North American elderberries as well, but beware, do not use the red elderberries. They are toxic and poisonous, but any raw elderberry is toxic mm. and it's um, cyanide and lectins that will make you sick. So if you cook them, those go away. And so that's what we're gonna do now. We're so gonna... you can't just pick an elderberry and eat it. Right. How much, about two ounces? Yeah, it looks like your note here says three quarters of a cup if you don't have a kitchen scale. Do you prefer to weigh things or do you do it both ways? I, I, with this one, you don't have to be that accurate, but I'm gonna measure about two ounces. That's two ounces there. Um, but if it was fresh, it's about two cups of fresh elderberry. Um, so I'm gonna just put that in my pot and then Let's see, these other things are optional. The main thing is the elderberry, but if you wanna put some cloves, ginger, um, you've got cinnamon there, 
This is cinnamon? Oh, yep. that sounds great. Rose hips is another one. It's high in vitamin C. Um, but we're really going for the elderberry. So we're just going to add, for flavor, like a few, what did I say, a few cloves. So it's about a teaspoon of cloves. In and there. Oh, it smells so good. Yeah, and that's Ceylon cinnamon too. That's beautiful. What what do you mean by Ceylon cinnamon? Well, there's a different variety. Mm -hmm. So now I'm adding about four cups of water to that. And now I have my woody herbs in my water and I'm going to boil this, simmer it for probably about 45 minutes. So it boils down to about half. And then we'll strain it into this mason jar here. And I happen to have like a nicely fitted strainer that fits in here. And once it is cool, then I can add my honey in there. And I usually add about um, one cup of honey to two cups of concoction. So when you're cooking that, is it, can you just cook it at a rapid boil really fast to reduce it? Or is it better to do low and slow for a longer period of time? That's a good question. I think some people like to do low and slow and they'll actually boil it, turn it off, and then the next day boil it again so it has a whole night to steep. Um, but yeah, woody herbs take time to like release all of their goodness. So, um, so maybe don't rush it. Yeah, don't rush it. So this is kind of fun. It's a family helping me in the mor morning, trying to get my honey to dissolve. So I'm just shaking and stirring and somebody's helping label. Labeling's important. Okay, okay. okay. so I've already um, strained my elderberry and um, you can see it's here in a beautiful red wine. Wow, look at that color. Mm -hmm. yes. It is a and, deep purpley and I would wine add, color. I would love to add like a label on here to show like the, mm. how long I should be storing this. So in a freezer, about six months. And that's how I store it most of the time oh, anyway. Really? Yeah, because it, it melts so quickly out of the freezer. Um, so I'm gonna probably put my ingredients on here and a date that I made this and be sure after six months, maybe to make a fresh batch. Um, another thing you can do is add a big dollop of peach brandy that extends the shelf life of your elderberry syrup and it tastes quite good. Yes, I bet. Um, yeah. So I did want to mention a little bit about properties of honey since we are the bee chicas. Honey is uh, antibacterial, antiseptic, antiviral, antifungal, it soothes, burns on your skin, promotes your immune system, reduces stomach upset, and it's moistening for the respiratory tract. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why it is good for like cold and flus promotes tissue healing and it's an it's it's an expectorant for the lungs as well. So that's so Tracy, honey is temperature sensitive, right? Oh yes, thank you, Deborah. So don't heat it above 105 degrees so that it still keeps its raw good properties. It's one of those amazing herbs. It's um, antiviral and anti-inflammatory, high in vitamin C and antioxidants like phenolic acids, flavanols, and anthocyanins. With elderberry syrup, if you take it within two days of getting a flu, that meta-analysis says that it reduces the, tree, the, the length of your flu-like symptoms for mm -hmm. by four days, like by half. Wow. Yeah. So Impressive. It is. Bottoms up. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I love that last little bit of music. That's Tracy Chica herself. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and a friend. So do we have any questions, Kathy? Um, yes, we do have some questions. Thank you for sharing that video. Um, so some of the questions that we had that I need to scroll down to. Um, so you were saying, you were talking about using red elderberries. Could you talk about the different qualities of elderberries and like how to know which one's the right one to have and if there's a way to test for efficacy with dried berries? So the, the darkest berries are the ones that you're looking for. Um, and um, I'm just gonna pass that on to, to Deborah for one moment. Deborah. Um, 
So Tracy mentioned in the video that the dark purple berries are the ones that you want to eat and that um, eating raw berries directly can possibly create problems for people. So um, I am not aware of any way directly to test dried berries for efficacy. I don't know if once you make your tincture, there's a way to test your tincture for strength. But I think with dried berries, if you go to a reputable source and buy them from a, a good um, herbal store or natural market, um, make sure and get organic, um, you'll probably be fine. And Deborah, okay. um, I think that what they're looking for is Sambucus nigra. If you're buying the dried ones from a apothecary or the grocery store. And Teresa, what's the name of the red ones? That I don't remember. I never buy them because they're poisonous. Yeah. We don't yeah. buy, we don't use them. Yeah, beware. The other one, the other one is canadensis. Um, okay. It's, it's Sambucus canadensis, and it's also a purple berry. So I use both of them because I grow both of them in our yard. Okay, perfect. So oh, great. great. Good. There's a, there's a couple local sources, sources um, Rebecca's Apothecary and Natural Grocers mm -hmm. and Mountain Rose Herbs Online as well, um, where you can purchase the, the black elderberry, the European elderberry. And then there's a there's a Native American um, elderberry that's also black. So you just, th that will also be sufficient. But the studies that we showed in the video were specific to that Sambucus nigra. And they're also uh, native in the Rocky Mountain region in our area. Great, and Cynthia, did you have something to add before we get to our next question? I think you want to stay away from common names and just watch out if somebody says, oh yeah, this is, my grandmother always called this an elderberry because yeah. there's a lot of people call a lot of things names that, that are not really specifically accurate. So if you're going to use it um, from the wild, make sure you know how to identify it. Mm -hmm. Also, Thank if you're you. using it fresh, you're going to want to reduce the amount of water. So you've got four cups of water to the, the two ounces of the dried, and it's good to leave it overnight, like Tracy suggested, because that plumps up those dried um, elderberries. But if you're using fresh, it has it has juice in it, and so you can reduce right. the amount of water by a cup. So make it yeah. three ounces instead. It, it, that way, Teresa, you're not boiling it so long and killing some of those flavonoids and those vitamins in it. That's right. So, if you're using the fresh yes all right now we have a, we have a, a a covid question and we're not medical experts but tina would like to know if elderberry syrup would be useful with covid stuff so maybe fighting off some of the symptoms it it is helpful to respiratory symptoms in flus and then there were some positive like um anecdotal um information we found on on the internet but we don't know like the credibility of that so if but it does help with respiratory symptoms in flus and that's um uh you know covid is a flu like um or sorry yeah covid is a respiratory problem uh, usually okay, tracy you. didn't you wasn't one of the um scientific tests you showed didn't it speak to the antiviral properties of elderberry and how effective it is against that? Right, yeah, it was it, both cold and flu viruses uh, were affected by elderberry syrup, like cutting flu's uh, symptoms down by half in a study in Norway in 2000. And then there was a whole meta-analysis that looked at a number of different studies with 180 different like double blind placebo type tests. And so there's some evidence showing it really is effective. Great, thank you. We have another question from a viewer. Skip Skippity is asking, where can you buy fresh elderberries? I don't know a place for fresh. Um, you may have a friend that grows them in their garden. I have probably several bushes um, and I pick them fresh, but you don't, you, you cannot use the stems. You have to de-stem the elderberries because the stems are poisonous. And as the other chicas mentioned, to eat them raw, it's poisonous as well. But I have nigra and canadensis sambucas in my garden. I pick them fresh, I de-stem them, and then I freeze them. And that's how I, I use my fresh ones. But Teresa, I, how, how much room do you need to grow the elderberry? 
you know, shrub tree. So those shrubs can get about 10 feet in diameter and about 10 feet high. But you can trim them too. You can make that, you can prune them. And the elderflowers are delicious, put mm -hmm. into fresh spring water as an elixir. I leave the fresh elder uh, flowers overnight in the refrigerator and then pour off the water. And oh, it's delicious. It's an elixir. <laughs> I would make yeah. friends with your local farmers. A lot of people that ha are, have organic farms have elderberries as part of their hedgerows. And so if you know, you know, when it's, they, they usually are ripe about um, August around here in near Boulder, Colorado. So that would be a good time to just check in with your farmers and say, hey, do you have any? They might say, we'll give them to you, but you have to de-stem them yourselves because that's a, it's a big job. <laughs> Sure. I like and them. Cynthia, is, are, are elderberry bushes, are they perennial? Yes, they're perennial and they like to be pruned. They're pretty brittle shrub. And so um, they, they're they really very, very easy to maintain. And, and, and I think I've seen them at like Growing Gardens has them as starters. And so some of your local um, flower and vegetable gardening shops can can help you get started and as i mentioned um, they're, they're native in our area they don't require a lot of water it's great, great to boost up your ecosystem in your garden as well with the native shrub mm -hmm. great. i have one more quick question do the birds love them because i know with some of my fruit bearing trees and shrubs i'm i'm sort of elbowing birds out of the way how about with the elderberries they love them yeah. And, and I share with the birds. I don't yeah. net my fruit trees or bushes. I love having the birds come into our gardens. They're great insect, you know, um, eaters. So they're, they're, they're beneficial. And right. once, once you recognize the elderberry bush, you'll see them growing around um, Boulder and Louisville and Lafayette. And um, I picked some from a, from a friend's house. So great. Um, I think that's the time we have right now before our next video to answer questions, but viewers, please put your questions into the chat and we will answer them again after the next video. Deborah, would you like to introduce the next video that we have? So a lot of people know about honey and beeswax as products from the hive, but I think propolis is less well known. And so it's a very potent, again, immune system support product and you can make a couple of different things. We're going to show you how to do a propolis oil and a propolis tincture in this video. Okay. Hi, welcome to our Bee Chica workshop, Remedies from the Hive. I'm Deborah Bee Chica. And I'm Tracy Bee Chica. And we are going to show you how to take some simple things from your pantry along with some important items from the hive mm -hmm. and make a few immune boosting remedies you can use throughout the year to help keep yourself healthy. So here are some great examples of different colors of propolis and the thing that makes each chunk a different color is the plants that the bees visit. So you can see everything from a deep red to a more golden color. Propolis infused oil. The recipe for propolis oil is 6.7 ounces of olive oil by volume, preferably organic to support the bees, and then using a kitchen scale, measure by weight 10 grams of propolis. If you have larger chunks of propolis, it works best to break them up so there is more exposed to the oil. An easy way to do this is to pop it into a bag and freeze it, then tap it with a heavy pan or rolling pin to break it up into smaller pieces. When you've combined the propolis and the oil, place it in a pan of simmering water. I put a hot pad in the bottom of the pan so the jar isn't directly on the heat. Okay, how long are we going to do this? At least 10 minutes and it could be longer, but you don't need more than 10 minutes. The critical part of this is the temperature. Okay. So you don't want to heat it above 120 degrees. Gotcha. So I had a question about like this much olive oil and um, with propolis, what do you do with all of that? I know it seems like a lot. You can make salves out of this. You can't take the tincture that is um, soaked in alcohol and turn it oh. into any kind of a balm. Yeah. But when it's an oil-based product, mm -hmm. 
You can add beeswax and lavender essential oil. Also like a face skin salve. It's beautiful for facial products because it's anti-inflammatory. So it's oh. really lovely for skin. Rosacea or something. And this could be directly put on a wound and we're done on our time. So I'm gonna take this out of the heat. Here I can move that. And let it sit here and cool. And from this point on, you can strain it through. You would pour your oil. Okay. Capture the propolis in here and then save that propolis because you can use it again. It's okay. good for at least another bath. But I wouldn't be able to use this again. <laughs> no. no, you a are propolis. dedicating yeah. a strainer right. to your propolis. Okay. okay, gotcha. Yes. And now we're going to talk about a tincture, which is used internally. And the way you make a tincture could not be more simple. The recipe for a tincture is one part propolis to nine parts alcohol. I like to use an Everclear, which is a very, very strong alcohol because it's been shown to be the most effective at breaking down the propolis and getting all those yummy bits out for your tincture. If you aren't a beekeeper with your own supply of propolis, try to connect with a local beekeeper from your area to source it directly or check online for bulk propolis suppliers. Etsy has quite a few listings for bulk propolis. An easy way to check for purity is to put one half teaspoon of your propolis in a glass of milk and let it sit on the counter for four days. If the milk doesn't spoil, you know your propolis is good quality. So let your tincture you just made sit for two weeks in a dark place, shake it a couple of times a day, and then you'll strain it like this one and put it in a dark bottle and it'll last for years. I use this for immune system health. You can take it daily. 20 drops a day, or if you feel something coming on or you're really fighting a bug, up to three times a day and it'll make a world of difference. I can tell that we are gonna be friends. Great. Thank you for that video. We had a question. Um, from Claire, I've heard some old school beekeepers say they would chew propolis almost yeah. like gum. Have any of you tried that? Yeah. <laughs> Teresa, you can talk to speak to that. Well, Tracy, you tell us about your experience. And then I'm a slightly allergic to propolis, just so you know that that's a possibility. So you have to make sure and test it because my lips swelled up. I put just a little bit of the tincture on a cold sore and my lip got super fat. And I, I think it's the, the propolis. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to try it in a salve though. Like Deborah was saying in um, for skin, you use an olive oil as one of the ingredients in making a hand salve or for, you know, a so face, face lotion. I'd like to try it that way. But Tracy, yeah. you should well, um, Between turmeric and propolis, I could have like completely yellow teeth. <laughs> does stain so beware um it takes like something fatty to help break it down so you can chew it with like an almond to act, instead of making your own tincture you can probably chew it with some some fatty nuts or something um but if i have a sore throat i i just stick it in the back on my back tooth and it slowly dissolves and helps helps my my throat and that's really what I use those propolis, um, that propolis for. I make a spray and um, when I'm not feeling well or my throat's just a little itchy because that's the first sign of sickness for me, I will spray a bunch in the back of my throat, maybe like three sprays. And, and I think depending on what trees they go to to collect the resin, mm -hmm. it will be different. Some is a little sweeter and some taste bitter. Absolutely, yeah. I yeah. try to mix like all different colors. This is, um. This is some propolis here, but, um, and Deborah showed in the video too, many different colors. And this is actually Deborah's honey jar, but yeah. <laughs> you need a new label on that. <laughs> Teresa, I think that was a really good point that you brought up that um, bees go to many, many different types of trees to collect mm -hmm. resins. And yeah. so if you have a birch pollen or a, you know, different allergy to different types of trees that mm -hmm. can also um, be a reason to to be aware of this of the propolis, and mm -hmm. yeah, be, and I'd like to also mention that the bees go to trees throughout the season. There's whenever there's um, 
a need in their hive to cover up something, to patch a hole. Uh, if they're sick. If they have any disease. Right. So another name for propolis is bee glue. <laughs> and as Tracy mentioned, there's a, there's a definite reason for that. It's very sticky. Inside the hive, we showed you a picture of that burst of propolis that was lifting up the cover inside of a hive and having the propolis just stretch up with the wood. Um, mm -hmm. The bees use it in construction. I mean, they fill cracks and um, stop mm -hmm. airflow and they'll reduce the entrance of their hive with propolis if they want to ward off an attack or if it's cold or windy. And one of the ways we can collect propolis is by putting a propolis trap in the hive, which basically mimics a bunch of different cracks. And so mm -hmm. the bees will come back to the hive and try to fill that trap in with propolis. And then we can take it out. Freezing it is the easiest way to get the propolis because once it's cold, it's very brittle. So you can take the trap and just twist it and you get all these beautiful little pieces of propolis to use. And, and Deborah, I'm using those traps to actually leave inside of the hive for the bees benefit. So there's research yes. at the University of Minnesota and it's it's become um, a, a way to promote bee honeybee health is yes. to actually rough up the inside of your hive, put in these propolis traps and leave them in there so that the bees are encouraged to collect more propolis because their own immune system doesn't have to work quite so hard the more propolis is, that's in a hive. Yep. Great. We had a comment from, from Karen saying, love the elderberry recipe. A functional doc shared elderberry can increase production of cytokines TNF-A and IL-6. I apologize if I mispronounced that. So if there could be some research to do in the event of COVID as cytokines are tricky with this virus. Oh. Um, so just kind of yeah, recognizing it's it's hard to do things. It's hard, it's hard to do some of these tests as well. Um, the next, did any of you want to comment? I have one comment that I didn't get in at that time, but I grow also black currants and there is a native shrub called the clove currant and they have really big, beautiful black currants. And I use a half a cup of those in my elderberry syrup and it's super delicious that way. And it mm. also has antioxidants in it. Yeah, those dark berries are amazing. Um, so another question from Ingrid, are the properties of propolis the same as pollen? And Ingrid, are you asking specifically for allergies or are you wondering about a different property? Um, Chica, do you wanna address that from what we know of Ingrid's question? Um, I can answer that. Our pollen is the honeybee's um, protein source and all bees protein source. So they eat it and feed it to their young. The propolis is more, um, they use that to clean the hive, um, like polish out cells, make uh, make like a, a cell ready for a new, another um, bee to, to develop. Um, it's their medicine rather than their food. Great, thank you. And Ingrid, if we didn't fully answer your question, please post a clarification. So friends, we're gonna go on to the next part of this workshop today. If you have more questions, please put them in the chat. Okay, so I'm gonna share um, a couple slides about how, how honey heals um, on your skin. And um, just one moment. Let's see. Tracy, while you're doing that, I wanted to mention I didn't get it into the video, but I read a lot of um, reports that people are using the propolis oil on animals as well. So they mix it in with their um, food and they seem to take it right away, but it's, it's a medicinal treatment, a veterinary treatment. So, and of course you could use it on a wound for an animal, but this was actually an internal treatment for pets. Right, and um, honey as well is used on wounds uh, for pets. Um, a uh, veterinarian from Fort Collins that I know uses it often, but honey is actually used at the Boulder um, uh, Hospital, the Foothills Hospital, in and uh, burn 
burn patients uh, to help heal your skin um, from burns or cuts or abrasions. So the reason that honey is so good for your, your skin and wounds is that um, it's a humectant. It keeps wounds moist to prevent scarring. Um, it's also, um, it has this osmotic quality like drawing fluid uh, from wounds. And when a fluid contacts honey, there are B enzymes, like small quantities of hydrogen peroxide are produced when, um, when honey is in contact with a little bit of fluid. So it's like just delivering a small amount of like um, hydrogen peroxide that won't like destroy or um, kill your healthy cells that are trying to to, to grow. Um, whereas something like Neosporin, uh, that's good at killing your, your, your good cells as well. So honey is, um, I mentioned this in the video, it's an antibacterial, antiviral. Um, it, um, and I mentioned all these things, it promotes tissue healing and it's a moistening for the respiratory tract and an expectorant for the lungs. And that's why it's really good for uh, respiratory um, symptoms from in flus. Um, this here is a medical grade um, honey ointment. And basically it's just Manuka honey mixed with a, a carrier uh, like um, Aquaphor. And uh, I don't know, can you see me? I hope so. Um, this is Aquaphor. It's a petroleum product. Um, and this is what they use in band-aids, uh, for instance, lining band-aids, uh, and for um, uh, for burn patients to heal skin. So they'll use, they'll actually apply this this honey manuka honey mix with um, this aquaphor or hydrophor is the term for it, and directly to wounds, and then they'll bandage those as well. And this photo is um, showing. Uh, the honey that we sampled at a workshop at the Boulder Public Library, um, probably uh, the year before last. Um, but this table here uh, had just all of our um, most medicinal honeys. The darkest honeys are traditional, tr like typically uh, have more of the medicinal properties for healing. But if you look at this slide here, this is a petri dish of MRSA. It's um, one of those stubborn superbugs that can't be um, treated easily with, with uh, antibiotics. But honey works miracles on this Petri dish. And Manuka honey, you can see um, the this is your control. So this is a bacteria blob in the middle. And then the area around it, um, or sorry, the whole tray is, tr is has the bacteria on it, sorry, growing. And then Manuka honey is dropped in, an, in, in a, here. You can see um, somebody's local wildflower honey, front, this is from New Mexico, is dropped here in the center. And then this area that's dark around it is preventing growth of any of the, um, the MRSA uh, bacteria. So looking at vancomycin, like a, a it's an antibiotic that's that's um, from your pharmacy. Um, its zone of inhibition is small compared to Manuka honey, but somebody's local honey, backyard honey, does an even better job of keeping those uh, MRSA uh, bacteria from growing. So, um, and then clover has a small zone of inhibition here. So it's saying that even clover raw honey has properties that are, are healing and antibacterial. Um, so um, that I find is just so interesting. Oh, so now how to make, I'm going to come back to you and make, um, the medicinal honey syrup. Oops. Um, Tracy, did you want your screen to be shown? Or are we focusing on your camera? Oh, um, well, you know, we can all be here. That's OK. I like seeing my the support from my beachy because <laughs> um, so um, I'm just going to mix up a little bit of the medicinal honey ointment for you and um, use a, like a tin that you can label. I've labeled the date on this. You want to keep this for no more than a year uh, or even less if you don't keep it clean. So um, 
clean meaning like oh, don't put your finger in it if you're going to be putting it on a wound. So if you have um, a cut or a burn, um, I usually let the cut, um, like I'll try to band-aid it together uh, with um, like a butterfly bandage or something and to hold it together, let it heal maybe um, for a day. And then I apply the honey on it to keep it from getting infected. Is that what you bee chicas do typically with honey ointment? I yeah. don't, don't wait. I don't wait. I put it right on there right away and then put it back yeah. on. And, and we have a question from a viewer, probably that would be helpful for clarification is, oh. are, are these honeys taken orally? The ones uh, that you're talking about. Oh, so these are for um, for skin and these are for wo wound treatment, that this honey ointment. So the Medi honey that's mixed with the petroleum, the petroleum is simply just a carrier so that it doesn't just ooze and drip off of your leg, for instance. So, um, so you could eat it if you didn't mix it with this because some of us simply use raw honey and we'll find a clean jar that we haven't opened yet. And, um, and then we will just dip a clean knife in there. And I apologize for that. Um, does anybody else want to tell how they sure. administer? Sure. I've got, uh, I have some questions too, but, and Ter Teresa, I feel like I talked over you. Did you have something else to add? No. Other, uh, okay. Teresa, is it when it's bleeding, do you put the Medi honey on it? I was like, no, you kind of wait for a little while just, and then apply it. Either raw honey, which I use very often, or the Medi honey. Great. And we also had an earlier question that I think Deborah um, was asking. They they wanted clarification on what you what you were talking about being used for pets. And I think we were talking about propolis at the time. Yes. So it was the propolis oil that I read about people using for pets. I think I think they'd be more resistant to using the tincture because it's so strong with the alcohol base. But they were using propolis oil with their pets the same way as immune system support for their pets internally. And then I remember reading something about somebody's dog that had stomach ulcers and they were giving the dog propolis oil for that. So um, there's a great website, FAO.org, food, what's it called? Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. And there is a long list of scientific studies that have been done on propolis from the 80s. And it, it is unbelievable the number oh, of yeah. things that propolis addresses that have actually been scientifically studied. So well, that's yep. a great, I think we put that website on our recipe sheet. It should be at the bottom down under resources. But that might be a fun way for people to explore all the different ways that propolis can contribute to your health. Great, thank you. And and while Tracy is um, dealing with her phone, shall we do some <laughs> of the other questions that we had? Yeah. While we wait for her to return. Um, so Cynthia, can I cut any rose hip out of my garden to use in this recipe? Oh, sure you can. It's, you're probably speaking about the elderberry and honey syrup recipe. And yes, rose hips are really, really high um, in vitamin C and antioxidants. You can go out and I go out and eat them right out of my garden. They're delicious if you pick them when they're perfectly plump and ripe. They do have seeds in them, which you can spit out if you want to. And sometimes if they're a little bit old, they're a little, they have some little um, prickly hairs in them. But to, it's a really good idea to put them, to cook them down just in with your elderberry syrup would be, would be delicious. Great. And you probably want to make sure that they're organic. So get them from a place that you know how they're treated. Exactly. Grow them yourselves or, and there's native Roses also, Rosa Glauca is a beautiful native rose that's stunning in the um, landscape and has great hips. So, and a lot of, of our Colorado native roses are wonderful. So Kathy, I was wondering if we could just point to our recipe um, uh, sheet that we've linked to. And um, because Deborah mentioned a website um, 
that's the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. This is an article, it's from 2000, but there's so much um, uh, information in there on each of the different products from the hive and then links to, or at least um, uh, references to like scientific papers on say propolis for prostate cancer or things like that. But at the top, there's also a link on um, how to make honey ointment. And if you just click on that link, there, it'll take you to Dr. Alan Dennison's website. And he talks about the science behind honey healing, but also a recipe. Um, but truly, it's, it's not a recipe. It's just using honey and a carrier. And you can use, instead of aquaphor, if you can see my cursor here, you can use other unpetroleum um, like substitutes. Like Cynthia likes to use waxoline. It's um, it's a beeswax uh, like carrier similar to aquaphor, um, and there's also um, lanolin that you can use as well. And then Dr. Alan Dennison mentions this Alba Botanica that has castor seed oil and coconut oil and beeswax in it too. So um, so this will tell you just um, a little bit about. Um, how to mix it and then the shelf life is unknown, perhaps many years, but eventually something might eat your honey. <laughs> so I think I think it's a good idea to throw it out after a year and use fresh honey. But again, crystallized honey is maybe a little more effective, extra potent and prized for medical use. So that's in the link that you have. Oops. Oh. Sorry. And and so you mentioned you you briefly mentioned Tracy and I think Teresa might have addressed this. Can you talk about like if you have crystallized honey, does that change how you use it in a recipe? And maybe maybe Tra Teresa can answer that. Which which recipe, Kath? Oh, what? does it it. So it would matter if it's yeah, the if it's the topical. No, I was thinking about the the elderberry syrup because we all use crystallized honey in our elderberry syrup, but we wait until the elderberry syrup is is barely warm and we mix it together so it you know melts the the crystallized honey, but you don't want it hot because if it's hot, then it you know uh, it's not raw the raw the honey anymore, but um. No, for the Medi Honey, I think we all just use a carrier. And Cynthia mentioned Waxeline, spelled W-A-X-E-L-N-E. -E, and that is made with beeswax. I think it's a great product. And you mix half and half, right, Tracy? Um, right, yeah. So I don't know if you can see, them. they're the same color. So I've got here honey and I oh, have, um, yeah. <laughs> so we'll get there. can you see the honey starting to drip? And I have a little bit of my aquaphor and that is it. And I, this is my recipe. And then I just mix it up <laughs> and um, I truly will use it on my, if I get a breakout like pimples, um, rosacea, there's a nice recipe, even on Alan Dennison's site. This is the first time I've noticed that. Um, he has um, uh, nine parts honey to one part glycerin and it's a mask that you can apply twice a day for rosacea. So that is something I might try because I, I do get rosacea sometimes or I have rosacea. It's so good also to, if you get like cracks on your feet in the dry winter weather, this is the perfect thing to put on your cracked heels and like painful little cracks on your fingernails and things like that. From and, it, and that, yeah, that's true. Some of that too is like, um, like, it's almost like it's healing, killing any foot fungus <laughs> at the same time that might cause cracking. So see how it's not dripping anymore? That's because of our little hydrophor carrier. But And then I like to use um, socks, af white socks, after you put all that honey stuff ointment on. Because oh, yeah. Otherwise, it's too sticky. <laughs> and do you have alternative oils from some of the ones that you that you mentioned, Deborah? for the propolis oil. Um, olive oil is just very stable. It has a long shelf life and it's it's in most people's pantries. So I chose that one. Um, you can use any oil, any um, organic sort of skin healthy oil. Calendula is lovely to use for the skin. 
Um, so that would be a good substitute. I think, you know, I think you could probably use anything you want, really. Um, Almond but oil. the olive oil definitely would have the most stability for the longest term. There's, there's almond you. oil as almond well. Almond oil would be great. Yeah, yeah. jojoba, yeah. If, um, if you're using it for your face, for instance, is really nice. Mm -hmm. Nice. And, and Teresa, so if you, like it looked like when Deborah was taking the propolis out to strain it, can you save and reuse it for another batch? Yes, absolutely. It's still potent. Mm -hmm. Would you say, would you agree, Deborah? Mm -hmm. I would. That recipe um, is for a 10% tincture. And most of the studies have been done on propolis in a 2 to 5% strength. So you're well covered with the first recipe. And even reusing it and doing it again, you'd probably get um, more than enough potency on a second batch. Even an alcohol tincture, Deborah? Or did you mean the oil? Oil. I think either because the alcohol doesn't really completely break down the propolis. And I'm glad you asked that, Tracy, because it doesn't disappear. You'll still have little chunks of propolis and little bits of mm -hmm. wax. You're getting um, the flavonoids and the esters from the resin. All those beneficial properties is what the mm -hmm. alcohol or the oil is breaking down but you should still have sediment in there that you'll need to strain and that's perfectly normal, so. Great, and, and Cynthia, does every beehive produce pro propolis that you can harvest? Yes, it does. Yeah, every honey beehive will produce propolis, some way more than others. And sometimes the beekeepers will, will get a little worried if there's a ton of propolis in a certain hive, they may suspect that you know, look closely at the brood and make sure there's not brood diseases if they're really coating the honeycombs with propolis. But um, yes, every every honeybee hive will give you propolis. And do the honeybees have to work as hard to make propolis as they do to make wax? They actually don't make the propolis, they gather it. So they go to trees and the resins and saps and things that are are um, expressing on the leaves or the bark of the trees. Um, usually injured areas, right, Cynthia, and leaf buds. Exactly, like when a, if you go and you break off a, a leaf off of plants, many times you'll be able to see a sap or like a little resin coming out at that, and that's what they're mining. So they go out to gather, like they would gather pollen or nectar, they bring it back to the hive and it also has bits of pollen and bits of honey and all kinds of other things mixed right. just from being brought into the hive with the bees. And so you get lots of extra benefits that way. And in our area, the poplar um, genre or species of tree is it, it, cottonwoods, and aspens. They get a lot of propolis from those yeah. trees. Oh, no. But resource wise, um, whoever asked that question is right. Beeswax is by far requires the most resources for bees to make. Thank you. So before before we turn it over to Tracy to tell us about the next Bee Chica workshop, was there anything else you wanted to add? Thank you. I so. All right. This was a fun one. Just wishing yeah. everyone a healthy winter. Yes. Yes. So, tell everyone. Yeah. Tracy, tell us what the next workshop is about. Oh, so it's on February 10th at the same time, a half hour, about a half hour workshop. And that's a very short amount of time to, um, to talk about beekeeping, but we are just going to going to try and interest you in beekeeping, um, tell you what it entails, like cost, resources, time, so that you can find out if you do want to become a bee, beekeeper. So that'll be uh, February 10th. Great. So in closing, I want to say Deborah, Tracy, Teresa, Cynthia, Beachikas, thank you so much for inviting us into your homes again and for teaching us to make scientific observations and hands-on projects with creativity for our better health. Um, thank you for all you do to support pollinators and educate all of us what we can do to support pollinators. Thank you, Jess, who is our broadcast engineer in the background. Mm -hmm. 
And thank you to the Boulder Library Foundation, along with everyone who tuned in. Thank you for all of your questions. And we I love your curiosity. As the B as Kathy, thank you for your moderating. Oh. And we look forward to seeing people back for the next one. Yeah, yeah thank you, Teresa. So finally, if you know anyone, um, audience members who would enjoy this event, remember this has been recorded and will be available to watch on the Boulder Public Library's YouTube channel. Visit boulderlibrary.org slash seed to table website for upcoming programs. We have a cooking program tomorrow, in fact, um, making some delicious recipes from Sri Lanka as part of our seed to table playlist. Ooh. So thank you very much. Good night, all. Be well.